ज्ञानंजन शलाकूरुन्मल तस्म श्रीगुर नम गुरव गौरचंद्रा राधिकाले कृष्णा कृष्ण भक्ताय तदभक्ताय नमो नम आनंदलीलमाय विग्रहाय हेम दिव्यचा सुंदरा तस्म महाप्रेमरस प्रदाय चैतन्य चंद्रा नमो नमस्ते चैतन्य चंद्रा नमो नमस्ते चैतन्य चंद्रा नमो नमस्ते कनक जलद गत्रो नील सोनाज नेत्रो मृग मद वर बालो मालती कुंद मालो थल तरुण वेशो नील पीतंबरेशो स्मर निवृत निकुंजे राधिका कृष्ण चंद्रो श्याम सुंदर शिखंड शिखर स्मर हास मुरली मनोहरा राधिका रस कम कृप निधे सुप्रिय चरण किंकुरीम कुरु तवैवस्मी तवैवस्मी नाजिबा मी तया बना ती विख्याय देवी तम नयमा First of all, I have for my sastang dandavat puspanjali, my heart like flowers thousands of times, at the lotus feet of my holy master, my supremely worshipable spiritual guru dev, Asmadiya Paramaraja to my guru pada padma, Nitya Lila Pravishta Om Vishnu pada, Ashto Tarasata Sri Rupa Nuga Chari Varya, Sila Bhakti Vedanta Narayan Goswami Maharaj. Secondly, I offer my pranam thousands of times at the lotus feet of my Param Guru Dev, and to Sri Prabhupada and to all of our Sri Rupa Nuga Gaudiya Guru Parampara. And finally, I offer my pranam to all the assembled Vaishnavas and Vaishnavis, Vancha Kalpa Turu Vista, Kupas and Dobevata, Putitanam Bhavane Bhu Vaishnavi Bhu Namunda. So we are. Hearing from Chapter Nine of uh, Bhagavad Gita, it's very important that when you are trying to enter into, by the mercy of Sri Guru and Vaishnavas, the deep meaning of each verse, that at the same time. You don't lose the context of the whole chapter, the structure of the chapter, uh, because by seeing the prasanga kram, that means the sequence of topics that Sri Krishna is addressing. Only by seeing the sequence will you be able to catch uh, the what Sri Krishna is communicating to the world. Through his instructions to Arjuna, so here we see in chapter nine, verse fifteen, Krishna is saying, "Gyana yagya na chapyanye yajanto mamu pasate ekatoena prakatoena bahuda vishmato mukam." There are other persons. Who engage in a gyan yagya, the sacrifice of knowledge, and they worship me, mamu pasate. How ekatwena, pritaktwena, bahuda, and vishvatomukam. That is, in a mood of oneness, in a mood of seeing me in many forms, or they worship me. As the universe. Now, let's look at this in context. 
in the beginning of this chapter, see Krishna said he would explain about pure bhakti, which is the Raja Vidya, Raja Guja, the greatest secret and the greatest education, the greatest knowledge, it's the purest thing, it gives you direct realization of the Supreme Truth and uh, it is uh, joyful and everlasting. Krishna began in this way. But then we see how, see Krishna began to describe his own opulences, how his personal beautiful Satchidananda Vigraha, his form, which is the most condensed, concentrated form of eternity, consciousness and bliss, which is itself the basis of all existence, that that very form is everywhere. That all things exist within him. All living beings exist within him. And that it is only by his will, by his Shakti, that all the uh, varieties of the world are manifest. So see, Krishna is beginning by speaking about his opulence. And the reason for this is to enter into the Raja Vidya, the king of all knowledge, the king of all secrets, pure bhakti, it is necessary first to surrender. Surrender. Now surrender, Sharnagati, it has its six angas. Anukul yasya sankalpa, pratikul yasya bivarjanam, rakshisya titi vishvasaro gopti tvei barnam tata, atmanik shepina kapanye, sadvida Sharnagati. The six limbs are to accept everything which is favorable for devotional service, to reject everything which is unfavorable for devotional service, to have the uh, confidence that in a time of difficulty, then Krishna will protect me, and to select Krishna as one's guardian and maintainer, that if I take shelter of Krishna, he will maintain me throughout my existence in the present and forever in, into the future to always be very humble and uh, to have no interest which is separate from the supreme lord so um, see krishna is explaining his all-pervasive nature his um, position as the origin of everything because First of all, all these different aspects of Sharnagati, surrender, they are the angas, they are the limbs, but they're joined to an angi, a body. Just like your limbs uh, cannot exist without the body to which they're joined. So similarly, the various angas, the limbs of surrender, all depend on the angi, mm. the body. And uh, that is Goptitve Barana to select Sri Krishna as your maintainer, that he will always support and protect you. So unless a person is fixed, has a very fixed uh, faith that Sri Krishna is all powerful, that Sri Krishna is all pervading, that Sri Krishna is the very essence and the soul of all existence, then a person cannot take shelter of him because we can only be in the shelter of that person who is powerful enough to protect us. So unless at first one has the Aishwarya Gyan, knowledge of Krishna's opulence, the Mahatma Gyan, the knowledge of Krishna's greatness, then one cannot take shelter of Sri Krishna as one's maintainer with full confidence. Now, another aspect of Sharnagati is the Atmanik Shepan, to give one's heart in such a way that one has no separate interest from Sri Krishna. So, we can only have no interest separate from Sri Krishna when we've understood that actually there is nothing separate from Sri Krishna. 
this is a very profound psychological point that our hunger, our ego, uh, gives us the impression that I am a separate individual being who is disconnected from God and from other objects. So because we have this ego that we are separate and independent from God, then we project that onto the world. Once there was a sadhu, he was giving a class. He was speaking on the glories of Lord Ramachandra. So it said that whenever someone speaks the pastimes of Lord Ram, then Hanuman, who is so eager, he's so greedy to hear the pastimes of Lord Ram, surely he'll be there in that assembly in some form or another. Mm -hmm. There may be a hundred people sitting, listening to that guitar, and perhaps some old person will come, down, come in and sit down at the back and listen, but you may not know, but that could be Hanuman. So Hanuman in, takes one form or another, and wherever Ram Qatar is going on, he comes and he sits there. Uh, we, we cannot say, perhaps today he goes on Zoom to listen. But Hanuman always, somehow or other, finds a way to listen to Harikata. So, one day, one sadhu was speaking the Ram Kata, and he described how Sita Devi was held captive in Ashoka Bhatika, that is a garden of the Ashoka trees. And he was describing how beautiful it is. So then afterwards, Hanuman approached him and he protested. He said, why are you saying that this Ashok Bhatika was a beautiful garden? That's not true. I am Hanuman. I was there. <laughs> I saw it. Everything was red. Every plant, every leaf, every tree in the garden was red. So then that sadhu said, no, Hanuman, <laughs> only you are so angry with Ravan that he had kidnapped Sita, that you are seeing that everything is red. So there's a, a Sanskrit saying, Atma man, man yate jagat. A person sees the world according to his own conception of himself. As he conceives of himself, he projects that upon the world. If someone is full of love, they will see love everywhere. If someone is full of hostility, they will see hostility everywhere. <laughs> so, the point is here that when a person has a hankar ego, I am an independent, separate individual. I am independent from God and separate from God. Then, by his vision, he looks at all the objects of the world and he conceives as them of them as all being separate from God and independent from God. Mm -hmm. and this is not a fact. So, now, also with that mentality, when a person has such a mentality, he tries to enjoy and taste, uh, to exploit those external and independent objects. And that experience uh, compounds his ego more and more. So we see as a general principle in spiritual life, uh, on the one hand, we have to surrender to the Supreme Lord. Bahunam janmanam ante jnanavam mam prapadyate vasudeva sarvamiti samahatma sudurlabha See, Krishna said, after many births and deaths, when one actually becomes situated in knowledge, then he understands, Vasudeva Sarvamiti, that Supreme Lord, uh, either directly or in the form of his energies, is everything, everywhere. And there is no Dvitiya Swatantra Vastu, there's no second substance, there's no independent subject, substance. This is the meaning of Advaita, non-duality. Non-duality is that you are aware that there is no swatantra vastu. There's nothing which is independent or separated from God. Though those things are distinct from his own swarup, Satchidananda Bigraha. But they're not independent or separate from him. So, uh, this 
uh, Sharanagati. First, understand the Aishwarya, the power, the opulence, the nature of Supreme Lord and His energies and how nothing is independent from Him. Then one can surrender. And we were saying that the essence of all religions is this uh, spirit of surrender, devotion to God, the door to which is opened by the spirit of surrender. And uh, at the same time, giving up the activities of exploitation, giving up sense gratification, which compounds our ignorance, our sense of separation. So in Sanskrit, the sense of separation or independence from Krishna is called Pritag Drisha. Pritag, pritag means separate and Drisha means a vision. So when we have Pritag Drisha, the awareness or the, the misconception, the, the invalid cognition that I am separate from God, I am independent from God, then we project that onto the world. So in the beginning of chapter 9, in order to open the door to the realm of bhakti, Krishna is describing his own power, his own opulence, his own all-pervadingness, his own um, full control over every minute aspect and detail of the world through the agency of his external energy maya. Madhyakshena prakriti suyate sacharacharam. By under my supervision, the material energy is manifesting all moving and non moving living entities. So then, after describing mm, his opulences, Sri Krishna describes the nature of pure bhakti and those who are practicing pure bhakti. He says, Mahatmanas tu mampata daivim prakritim asrita bhajantyananyam manaso gyatva bhuta dimavyayam. Those who are Mahatma, the great souls. Mm -hmm. So they are mm, under the shelter of my internal ponsi, daivim prakritim asrita. Or one might say they are completely um, infused with the Holy Spirit. That is, that is bhakti. Krishna's devotional energy. So those persons, Bhajanti Ananya Manaso, they are serving me with undivided attention. Ananya, they have no other desire. And they know that I am the source of all existence. Satatam Kirt. After describing the Mahatmas, the great souls, now Krishna is coming to, now we're on the verse for today, chapter 9, verse 15. Jnana yagyena chapyanye. There are others who perform jnana yagya, a sacrifice of knowledge. So here the word anye means others. So to understand the meaning of this word anya, others, we have to know, well, other than whom? So when Krishna said there are others, he means other than the Mahatmas, the great, the great souls. And he is describing um, three persons who do upasana or worship him in three different ways. Those who worship with the conception of ekattva, oneness, pratakwa, difference, and Vishwatom will come with the conception that the universe itself is God. So, what we find here in the Bhagavad Gita is a really broad, universal taxonomy or categorization of all the different levels of. Uh, religiosity, religion, or conceptions of God, how God may be uh, in the minds of people of different adhikar, different levels of eligibility. So it's really something 
quite wonderful. Generally, in religious books, we have the definition of a particular religious conception. And what is different to that is heretical and uh, wrong. And, and, uh, but here in Bhagavad Gita, see Krishna is giving an explanation of the entire spectrum of possible conceptions of God that the living beings have. And he's also arranging them in a hierarchy, which conceptions are superior to other conceptions. And how, not that it's just completely black and white, if you have this idea, you're right and you're saved, and if you have this idea, you're wrong and you'll be condemned forever. But rather, see, Krishna is showing how there's an evolution, that the person may be in one stage for some time, until he becomes purified. And then later in that life, or in a future life, he'll come to a higher conception. And by following that, gradually, either in that life or in a future life, he'll come to a higher conception, and a higher conception, until eventually, by Krishna's mercy, which comes to us through the association of the Mahatmas, the pure devotees, then a soul himself can come to that highest level of Mahatma, of being uh, a great soul who is engaged in Ananya Bhakti, pure, unalloyed love for Sri Krishna. So, um, what I'd like to do now for the, the rest of this discourse today is essentially mm, look at Sri Krishna's instructions here in Bhagavad Gita and give you, if you, if you like the a schema, um, a map or a diagram of all the levels of Adhikar that Sri Krishna is describing in Bhagavad Gita, in this chapter, and also it's, it's obviously it's related to other chapters as well, but specifically in this chapter. So let's start from the top and then go down step by step the various levels of eligibility, the various stages of the expansion or contraction of consciousness that are possible in this world for all people. And uh, this is such a presentation Sri Krishna is giving in Bhagavad Gita. It has a very vast scope. And uh, yourself and everyone you know in the world fits somewhere onto this uh, diagram of possible conceptions in the gradual ev evolution of a living being. It's really wonderful. So let's get started on this. So we start at the top. Krishna has just discussed in the previous two verses, Mahatman Astu Mampata, who are the Mahatma, the great souls. The, they are engaged in Kevala Bhakti, pure devotion. That means they're serving Krishna only to please Krishna without any other consideration. And the soul, the, they are... Uh, liberated in the fullest degree from the maya, from illusion, from the material energy, and they attain a position in the spiritual world, in the highest level of the spiritual world, directly related to Krishna in his most lovable form. Mm -hmm. You should know that, see, Krishna's human lo most human-like form is the most superior. Why? Because it's the most lovable. Mm -hmm. So th those are the Mahatmas, the Kevala Bhaktas, the Ananya Bhaktas. So now we come down to the, the next level. So previously in chapter 7, Sri Krishna had said, Chatur Vidha Bhajanti Mam Jana Sukriti Narjuna Ato Jigyasu Atati Gyani Cha Bharata Shabha there are four types of persons <clears throat> who surrender to me. And they are the uh, artha, those who are suffering, 
Jigyasu, those who are inquisitive, Artarti, those who have desire wealth and power and enjoyment, and Gyani, uh, those who are um, desiring knowledge, liberation. So, uh, these four types of persons, they are not Ananya Bhaktas. Their Bhakti is not pure. Uh, they are called Pradani Bhuta Bhaktas. That means that their Bhakti, mainly they're doing Bhakti. Pradani means what is the main ingredient. There's a, there's a nyay, a logic. Pradanye na vyapadesha bhavanti. Pradanye na vyapadesha bhavanti. Vyapadesh means the um, nomenclature. A name is given to something, pradanyena, according to that which is predominating in it. So they can, they're, these four types of persons, they're doing pradani bhuta bhakti. It's called bhakti because bhakti is the main thing, but it is mixed. So the, uh, of these four, we'll go through them one by one. The best among them, they are the jnanis. So they're doing bhakti, but their bhakti is uh, jnana mishra bhakti. They are nishkam. They have no material desires. They are nishkam. And they are jnana, uh, jnana mishra bhaktas. They're doing devotion mixed with uh, the jnan, some desire for liberation. But bhakti is prominent. So the example here, uh, are the four Kumaras. Now, what's the result of this type of bhakti? When bhakti is predominating, but it's mixed with the, the practice of the, the angas of jnana yoga, then it leads to the attainment of shantarati, a love, but in shanta, shantaras, shantarati. But, if su such persons can get the association of pure devotees, they'll also become Ananya Bhaktas. And the example is Shukadev Goswami. Shukadev Goswami was in Shantarati by the association of his father Vyasadeva. And hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, he became absorbed in Prem. So then he became a Mahatma and he moved up to the next category, the topmost category. He became a Mahatma. Kevala Bhakti, Ananya Bhakti, Prema Bhakti. So then, the next, next level down, they are the Jigyasu. Jigyasu means they are inquisitive. So the example is given of when the Srimad Bhagavatam was spoken by Sutta Goswami, it was spoken as the answer to six questions which were posed by Shonaka and the rishis of Naimisharanya. So Shonaka and the rishis of Naimisharanya, uh, they are, they were actually Sakham. They had some worldly desires. They were Karma Mishra Bhaktas. They wanted to do Bhakti, but they had some uh, worldly desire. And they, but they were inquisitive to know about Atma Tattva. What is the soul? So what is the spirit? And so, now, if a person follows the Karma Mishra Bhakti, then by the power of Bhakti, their desires become fulfilled. They get the fulfillment of material desires. And then, when they are satisfied, or rather, or when they become dissatisfied, that the so-called material satisfaction is, doesn't really give the fulfillment to the soul, then, uh, uh, they attain Salokya Mukti. In other words, Bhakti gives them liberation, but to Vaikuntha, to the place where the Aishwarya, the opulence of uh, the Supreme Lord is predominating. So that's called Sukhaishwarya Otara Mukti, a state of liberation in Vaikuntha, which is predominated by enjoying the opulences of Vaikuntha. So, 
Otherwise, those um, jigyasu, inquisitive persons like Shonika and the rishis of Naimisharanya, if they get sadhu sangha and they become nishkam, they become free from desires, then they will get shantarati, and then again by sadhu sangha they can attain prem. So uh, these are this is this is the the possibilities, the evolution which is possible for those in the category of the inquisitive. So then the next category that Krishna has spoken of is Artha Arti. Those who are worshipping God because they want cash, they want money, they want a kingdom, a palace, beautiful wife or husband or fame or whatever it is of this world. Artha Arti. So the classical example uh, from the scripture is uh, Dhruva Maharaj who was doing bhakti to get a kingdom that was superior to the kingdom of his father because he'd been um, by his stepmother he'd been told that he could not inherit his father's kingdom so he wanted to get a kingdom which was greater than his father's so uh, that person he's doing Sakam Karma Mishra Bhakti the doing bhakti but it's mixed with karma and that karma is not nishkam without desire but it's it's with worldly desire so what happens to them so then they will uh, by the power of bhakti the desire will be fulfilled and they can uh, attain give up that desire and attain salokya mukti uh, some vaikuntha uh, type of liberation personal liberation in vaikuntha or if they become nishkam, free from desires, then they'll attain shantarati and association of a pure devotee and attain brain. So that these are the possible roots. This is a very beautiful description that Sri Krishna is giving in Bhagavad Gita because he's showing what level any particular soul can be on and the particular route or the possible, the variations of the possible routes through which they can go to, to be liberated from this world, to go to Vaikuntha or even go beyond Vaikuntha to the, to the state of pure praying for Sri Krishna in Krishna Loka. So it's a very um, optimistic picture of the world. This is the Vaishnava's mentality. Swastyasu visvasva kala prasidatam. May the whole world become, everyone in the world, may everyone's life become auspicious. And the wicked persons, they should also become satisfied and pleased. Uh, we should not wish ill upon anyone, but everyone in every position is in a particular stage of their evolution. And there's a route, there's a path uh, by which they can gradually come to the eternal service of Sri Krishna. So then, uh, the next stage is the Artha, the next level down is the the distressed person so the distressed person the the, the artha the classical examples which are given are um, gajendra of course who was being attacked by the crocodile and uh, dragged under water to his death so he surrendered and then uh, there are the other classical example are the the kings who had been uh, captured and were being kept prisoner in the castle of Jarasandha. So they prayed to Krishna and they took shelter of Krishna because they were distressed by their imprisonment. So uh, they are, these are in the category of Sakam Karma Mishra Bhakti. They're doing Bhakti. Bhakti is predominating. It's mixed with uh, Karma, the performance of some uh, fruitive activities and it's sakam they have some desires that to be fulfilled so they also go through the evolution of their desires become fulfilled and then they become disinterested in that and then they can attain mukti to vaikuntha by the power of bhakti or they can become free from desires um, and then they become jnana mishra bhaktas they attain shantarati and by the association of pure devotees then they can also become pure devotees. So now, now this explanation, we're giving this explanation, why? To clarify 
what Krishna is saying in this verse, chapter 9, verse 15, Jnana Yagena Chapyanye, there are some other persons who worship me, Krishna said. So when Krishna says there are other persons who worship me, this word Anya, other, means these persons, they are not the Mahatmas, the great souls who are in pure bhakti, but they're also not the four types of persons who surrendered to me that I've described in chapter 7. Understand? So this, this is why it's very important when you look at one verse, it's, it has to be understood in the context of Krishna's entire presentation. So when Krishna says, Jnana Yagena Chapyanye, there are some persons who worship me by a Jnana Yagya, and they are other, so it should be very clear. They, they are not the Mahatma, they are not great souls that I've just described. And they are not the four persons who are also not Mahatma. They're not the great souls, but they're very lucky because they're rendering the Pradani Bhuta Bhakti. They're rendering service to me, uh, predominated by Bhakti, though it, their Bhakti may be mixed. In the case of the Jnani, it's Jnana Mishra Bhakti. And in the case of the Jigyasu, the Arta Arti and the Arta, uh, that is a Karma Mishra Bhakti. So now in this verse 9, 15, Krishna is saying, I'm talking about three other persons now, separate from the Mahatmas and the four types of persons who surrender to me. So let's have a look at who they are, what their conception is, and what their path uh, to uh, perfection might be. So first of all, Upasate. Those who worship me with a conception of oneness. Now these are known, technically known as uh, Ahangra Upasakas. The persons who are worshipping God with an idea that I am the object that I am worshipping. For example, Ahangra Pasana is um, one part of Vaidhi Bhakti, uh, not pure, but one part of, of Vidhi, which is given in scripture. For example, um, if a person is decorating the deity and he's offering Krishna a flute, so the person may take the flute and before offering the flute to the deity, then the uh, Pujari may take the flute and hold it himself like this. And meditate for a moment. I am Gopal. And then offer the flute to Gopal. So this is called Ahangropasana. Or the identification of the worshipper with the object of worship. So now what's to be understood here is these three persons which are discussed in this verse. Are distinct from the Mahatmas and the four persons who surrendered to Sri Krishna uh, because they're in the category of Guni Bhuta Bhakti. Guni Bhuta Bhakti means they're practicing Bhakti, but their Bhakti is not predominating over Karma, Jnana or Yoga, but rather their Karma, Jnana and Yoga are predominating over their Bhakti. And the reason, the motivation for which they're performing Bhakti is to get Mukti liberation. Hmm. So, this first category, Eka Twena, they're worshipping Krishna even, or Narayan, and, and they meditate, I am Narayan, or I am Gopal. Hmm. They think that they are one with Brahma, with the truth. So they are the, the first category here. Now Krishna is saying, Pratakdvena. So these persons are called Pratikupasana. The word Pratik means uh, a, an image which is a substitute for something else. So they don't know it, they don't understand it, but uh, they're worshipping Indra or they're worshipping the sun god or different demigods, many different forms, and thinking, oh, Brahman, the supreme truth, is 
I am worshipping in the form of the sun or in the form of Indra or in the form of the uh, any other demigod. So that is they are the Pratikupasanas, they're worshipping some vibhuti, some mani, that means some opulence of God and seeing this is God. They're, they're, they're worshipping something which is actually a substitute for the, for the Satchidananda Vigra, the true spiritual form of God. Now, these persons are inferior to the persons who are doing Ahangrupasana, identifying with the, uh, themselves with the object of worship. Now, why is that? Why are the Pratikupasanas considered to be inferior? And the reason is what we were discussing before, Pratakadrisha. Pratakadrisha, they have a, a sense of separation. They have an ego of separation. At least those who are worshipping with the uh, Hangrupasana, they consider themselves to be not independent from the Supreme Truth. They have uh, some idea of Advaita, of non-duality. So there's a, there's a certain kind of surrender, if you like, <laughs> involved there, the surrender of their ego. Whereas those are doing Pratakduena, not only are they worshipping a substitute for God as God, but they also consider themselves separate from that uh, substitute also. So their consciousness is in a lower category because they haven't been able to understand the essence of surrender. They have not been underst understand that the truth is beyond duality. They're firmly situated in in duality and they're worshipping demigods now the demigods have bodies made of uh, subtle energy so now we come to the next level that Sri Krishna is discussing here Vishwa those are uh, those who worship me as the universe so they're called Vishwarup Upasakas the worshippers of God in the form of the universe so they're inferior still why because not only do they consider themselves to be separate, they have a separate ego from the object of worship, but also they're not worshipping the devatas who are Krishna's vibhutis, Krishna's manifestations of his uh, glory and opulence with subtle bodies, with bodies made of subtle matter, but they, they're conceiving of, of God as the gross physical energy. The universe itself is God. So they're on the next level down. Hmm? But anyway, they are doing this Gyanyagra and the purpose of what they're doing is to become liberated. So then, uh, we, we are discussing today verse 19. If you look at chapter uh, verse 20 and 21, the next two verses that come, see Krishna is describing now the Sakam Karma. Uh, those who are performing karma, karmic activities with a desire to get Swaraga, to go to heaven. So they're the next level down again because they're not even performing their uh, worship to be liberated from this world. They're performing uh, 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 the karma kanda rituals, the religious rituals of the Vedas to just get promoted to a higher position to enjoy what they consider to be a superior level of enjoyment in this world. So that's what Sri Krishna describes in nine, uh, 20 and 21. Then in verse 22, Sri Krishna is returning to his Ananya Bhaktas and he says, Ananyas chintayantumam ye jana paryapasate te sham nityabhyuktanam yoga sema vahamyaham. That, look at this, these persons who are doing ritualistic activities to get the fulfillment of their worldly desires. Oh, what is this? My devotees, they don't need to do any of these things. They're fully focused on me. Why? Because the worldly necessities, the things that they may need in life, I bring it myself and I'm happy to serve them in that way. It gives me great joy to serve them. So what you have here in chapter nine is a suite of verses 
And the suite of verses is giving us insight, uh, a schema, a diagram, a hierarchy of different levels of consciousness and how close or far away they are in their evolution from attaining the perfection of pure love for Sri Krishna. Okay. Bhagavad Gita ki jai. Swayam Bhagavan Sri Krishna Chandra ki jai. Gaur Premanandi. Hari Hari Bhav.